Dr. Rob, feeling no pain. Feeling no pain, my friend. Well, I'm drinking, you know, I, I recommend people don't drink these, but I'm, I'm hitting the zero sugar monster energy drink fortified with L-carnitine and taurine. Yeah, uh, the, 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 no, no beer for Dr. Rob today. No alcohol for Dr. Rob today because he had some last night. You had the 20-year med school? 20-year unit class of, class of 2004 UNMC 20-year reunion. You know what's weird is that I've been with you every step of the way. I went. I, we were together doing sound off during med school. Yep. Uh, residency. I, residency, and then full fledged doctorhood. Seen the whole process. And, and the amazing thing is, and and I'm not lying here, because even most friends will have quarrels or disagreements or get sick of one another. I, Dr. Rob and I, over the last twenty plus years, have never had a spat. It's because I'm that good of a friend. <laughs> Is that what it is? You're that good of a friend? <laughs> no, I was just thinking about that. We we've never had a spat. We've never had a because we've how many podcasts? Well, you, well, we've done hundreds of podcasts yeah. together. All the shows, all the TV shows together, radio time. And, and I've just become accustomed to you being late all the time. Yeah, I dude, I do owe you for that. One. No, uh, well, it's it's <laughs> weekly, so I yeah. I always joke with Owen. I go, Doctor Rob's going to be late for his own funeral, so it's just a it's uh, we'll, we'll start his funeral at least fifteen to twenty minutes late when and if he dies. I am going to put that in a will that like like I, like when it kicks off, just nothing's going to happen, and then I'm going to have a couple people from the funeral home come like hauling down the aisle in the church with a casket on wheels like <laughs> like a bat like bat out of hell. If you're new to the podcast and watching right now, make sure to hit the subscribe button to the YouTube channel because uh, we like accumulating subscribers. It's just good to know you have a following and, and, and people like to watch the content. Last week, I think it was on Thursday, or actually it was Wednesday, we, la- we put a uh, podcast out with Frank Solich. If you haven't heard that, it was fun to catch up with Frank. We didn't talk about it much last week, but it was fun to catch up with Frank. The thing that was interesting was him. I never think about games that haunt coaches because there are some games that bother you as a player that are always going to stick with you in one way, shape or form. Um, And that even it kind of lessens over time. I mean, everything becomes a little bit more homogenous over time in terms of how different games affected you. I never really thought about did did specific games ever haunt a coach? And it was interesting talking to him about the games that haunted him as a coach, because it, and it comes right at the end of the pot, so you got to listen to the whole thing. But you get to the end of that, and he kind of starts going into that. And I thought it was a really really interesting discussion on how literally just a couple of these football games affected them. And, and, and it actually wasn't the games I thought it would be. See, and I, I think I correctly picked them because I, I brought you? those two games. I brought the Texas game up uh, in 99 at Texas. Yeah, that, that wasn't his fault. I mean, at the end of the day, Carl Buckalter and Dan Alexander just fumbled the ball a lot, yeah. and you couldn't do much about the turnovers. Uh, but the other game will keep it as a suspense because I'm with you. I didn't, th- I didn't think it was going to be that one. He brought that one up himself. and I'm There's like, another one in there you think it would have been and it's not yes uh the the thing that surprised me about that was his regret if you remember of course he went on to coach at ohio but the year before he was going to take the army job yeah he got they they i don't know if recruits the right word they recruited him pretty hard to be the coach and he got caught up in the moment and he was going to take the the army job they had a big announcement planned i believe over the army navy game and he backed out, and he goes into that. Just he, you could tell that bothered him too. Just the yeah. way that went down. It's a very human interview, and I thought that. I mean, he he really kind of opened up on some of these things. I wasn't quite expecting to hear that. Yeah, I, I'm not going to say that. You know, we've had the best interview with Frank because he's done a lot of interviews. But the human side of it, that's probably the most human I've seen Coach Solich uh, in a long, long time. So if you want to see that, it's right here on the podcast on the YouTube channel. So another reason 
reason to hit subscribe. Another reason to hit subscribe on the YouTube channel. Wednesday nights, we do Behind the Point Spread with Scott Spritzer. We take a, an NFL game and four or five college games and really dive in deep to those and have a good conversation from a better's perspective. Um, so if you haven't checked out Behind the Point Spread, be sure to do that. Uh, Dr. Rob's not wearing them today, but I'm wearing my G-Defy shoes, and we encourage you to wear your G-Defy shoes. You can see they're stylish. I got my blue ones on today with my yellow lime green. Is that Gatorade yellow loose uh, shoe? It's loose like fl- and that's uh, that's highway construction worker yellow. So I went on a nice uh, three about three and a half mile walk with my dog yesterday. No foot pain, no ankle pain. Uh, the Verso Shock technology does such a wonderful job of alleviating that pain. And it's cool to get the comments of people who are ordering the the Gita fives are happy with them. And don't forget they've got uh, they've got tennis shoes, they've got uh, flip flops, they've got sandals, they've got work boots, any type of shoe that you want, and uh, they have a sixty day money back guarantee. So you can wear them, and if you don't like them, send them back. I found out a couple of my med school classmates are now wearing g after wow. listening to the podcast. I'm telling you, I need you to shoot some video, be a content creator if you wearing g I, I do need to. Walking down the street, I'd be like the uh, the real housewives yes. who are now g wearers. We may have a YouTube special coming up where we talk to the owner of g because I want to know how you just decide to start a shoe company, right? I mean, it's like, I, I think I'm going to start a shoe company. Well, and how do you... Like the ideas behind it that go into the construction of these shoes, the the design. Yeah. How do I mean? How do you come up with something and be like, okay, well, I think this is going to work great, and it does. They probably bring some orthopedic guy in and do the the science and the physics behind it. Uh, but if you want a deal on your GDFIs, you can get twenty dollars off an order of a hundred dollars or more. Just use the promo code Doc Talk. That's the promo code Doc Talk at checkout on an order of a uh, hundred dollars or more, and you're going to get twenty dollar rebate off your first pair of GDFIs. So that's pretty cool, uh, Doctor Rob. The Huskers easily beat Purdue. It could have been much worse. I want to dive in right away to what everybody's talking about. And and I mean, everybody's talking about. I put this out on Twitter yesterday that Big Ten officiating is horrible. I texted that to you, and you gave what I think is going to be an unpopular answer, and that you said this. You didn't say it was horrible. What you said was, and I'm speaking for you, I actually agree with the calls. They're just calling everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there wasn't a call. Well, the offensive pass interference on Nebraska, I thought that was a little sketch. Yes, 100%. I I will say that, but I mean, here's the thing. Nebraska got hit for 94 yards in penalties. Purdue got hit for 165 yards in penalties. That's a shit ton of penalties, Trav. I mean, Nebraska penalized 11 times, Purdue 13 times. Remove remove the the offensive pass interference on Nebraska. Heck, even remove the offense. Well, that offensive pass interference against Purdue. That one I thought was fairly blatant. I mean, the guy just boom. He just shoved the defender, made the catch, touchdown. That one I thought was pretty blatant. Can't do that. Um, but the calls. When I watched the the replays, when I watched the calls, it's the correct call. Um, it, it's just, we've talked to enough officials and they kind of get together and they have, they do a pregame huddle and they're like, all right, there's going to be some gray area. There's going to be some ones when in real time, it looks kind of close. Are we going to just let guys sort of play that play it out and play the game? Or are we calling everything? Because whatever we do, it's got to be consistent. And I think most people most fans are fairly comfortable with officiating as long as it's consistent. To be fair, it was consistent. They were calling everything, but they were, and they were doing it on both teams. It's not like Nebraska had 94 yards and penalties and Purdue had 20 because we've seen that before too, where damn near everything gets called on Nebraska. I mean, Go back, look at that Colorado game. I mean, the number of holding calls that should have been called on Colorado's offensive line. And I I always joke, I see no hold. Um, But Ty Robinson and Hubbock were getting tackled from behind by O-linemen that entire game, and they never called it. 
okay, you don't want it. Bla- you don't want to see that level of blatant no calls. But be consistent with it. And I thought this was a, f- a fairly consistently called game in terms of who they were hitting. I know Purdue was frustrated with all the pass interferences that were being called. But when I'm watching them, the Nebraska defenders trying to catch the ball, the Purdue or the Nebraska receivers trying to catch the ball. The Purdue defenders were not turning around at all. They're face guarding, they're making contact, and they've got their back to the ball every single time. That's pass interference. The ref has to throw the flag. Now, you can kind of let guys play, and you can do it both sides. They just did the opposite. They called every damn call, but I do think it was a very consistently called game. You know that's going to be an unpopular opinion, though, right? I mean, yeah. a- Adam Carricker was complaining about him. Every fan that I know is complaining about well, him. Well, I mean, it. I thought the, I thought the penalties that were called – When you look at it over the course of the game, in the situations in which they were called, I still think Nebraska was the net winner here in terms of it. But but I mean, it's to Purdue's own fault because those all those pass interferences were pass interference, in my opinion. Um, Purdue's just not a very good team. No, they're not good at all. Which that's why this game is a little frustrating to me. And, and I know a couple of people after looking at the grades, and I had some comments on Twitter about how the final score does not tell the whole story. You, you'll get the score. Yeah, yeah Nebraska twenty eight ten. Purdue scores a junk touchdown late when Nebraska and Nebraska did. They put the backups in the backups that they had on that road trip. They had all backups in there late in the game. Good for those guys, and I'm glad rules can continuing to do that in games like this, get those younger guys some reps. Um, You'd look at that and go, okay, well, Nebraska had a solid road win in the Big Ten. It was 0-0 at halftime, and I uh, Ben Stevens, who's a great follow on, follow on Twitter, he kind of posted one of those, posted the first half, uh, possession chart, <laughs> like he had one of those like hang it in the Louvre type comments. And it's just punt, punt, missed field goal, punt, blocked field goal, punt, punt, missed field goal, punt, punt, blocked field goal. And it's just, it, it's, it's penalties and spe- special teams miscues. It's these little things that allow a statistically dominant football team, which Nebraska has been, to lose a game against a lesser opponent. And we've seen this for years. And it's not getting cleaned up yet. And it that's what killed Nebraska against Illinois. I mean, when you go back and you look at that Illinois game going into this weekend, you look at the special teams miscues. You look at the missed field goal. You look at all the penalties. You look at the turnovers. You remove everything. Any one or two of those miscues, penalties, or turnovers, any one or two of them, just reverse one or two plays in that Illinois game, and Nebraska wins the game. Nebraska's one or two plays from being 5-0 and and probably ranked in the teens, 16, 17, 18, 19, somewhere in there right now. Basically where Illinois is or was prior to their loss to Penn State last night. Which was closer than I thought it was going to be. It was. I mean, I do not think Illinois is a bad team. But that also makes me look at Nebraska and say – I don't want to say Nebraska is a good team. They've got the makings of a good team, but good teams don't have all these penalties. Good teams play good special teams. Good teams don't have two field goals blocked and a third one missed. These are things that frustrate me because it's come back and it has haunted Nebraska in the past. It's bit Nebraska in the ass in one game already this year. And it led to Nebraska having a 0-0 first half against a very poor Purdue team. They got two good running backs. They actually have some good linemen on both sides of the ball. I actually think Purdue's offensive line and defensive line are solid athletes, solid units. They're just not playing good football on the whole. Well, let's go to the special teams because that's something you gave an F to yesterday. And I, I texted you in the first half. I said, you just want me to mark down an F now? because <laughs> Which, which I, I, I mean, the lone bright spot's Bushini. 
So he's punting. They got him doing kick. I'm waiting for the. I'm waiting for them to just move him in as as the kicker as well. Guess what? You're doing everything, buddy. Um, <clears throat> his punts were great. He really did a good job punting. His directional and placement punts, where he's trying to drop that. I mean, th- those punts where you're trying to drop it just straight down and stick it inside the five yard line. He's hitting those. I mean, you had one that rolled into the end zone because the damn punt coverage wasn't paying attention like they should have been and didn't have the focus they should have had and could have literally stuck that ball at the at the two yard line and they let it roll into the end zone. I mean, that's not on Bushini. So when I give them an F, I mean, if I could give individual guys a a, a grade, Bushini's getting an A minus, maybe an A. The rest of the units, holy cow. I mean, you got to have better coverage. You got to have better kickoff coverage. You got to have better punt coverage. Um, blocking needs to be better up front on PAT field goals. I mean, we were four and four of four on PATs. That's great. And he's line driving those field goals at a super low angle. The snaps not getting there. The the holds are the, the, well, well, the snaps. It, the snaps make the hold. Yeah, delayed. I, I I actually I think the I, I think the holders doing a, actually a heroic job of getting the ball and getting it at least into into a position where you can attempt to kick at it. So, and well, and the other thing is too, is maybe that snap is that snap and the resulting hold is what's screwing up was screwing up hole on those, on those kicks where he was kicking them so low. Um, that throws your timing as a kicker off when you're waiting for that hold to get placed. But I thought the holder did a great job and maybe I shouldn't be as critical as whole as I am when you look at where those kicks were going. Um, so maybe, I mean, it, it, everything affects everything else. But yeah, it's we got to get that snap down. I saw Alex Henry, former Nebraska kicker, on Friday. I said, "Hey, did they did they ask you to come in too to work with the kickers?" He's like, "No." Um, of course, they've brought in some extra help. It, it, kickers get the yips, much like pitchers get the yips in baseball, right? I it mean, is. It's. I mean, even hitters. I mean, it, it's almost any sport can have that. And, and it's one of these things where it's just it's you start playing little mental games with yourself, and when it's I call it singular event athletics, kicking, golfing, baseball, whether it's pitching or hitting, where it's it's a single motion, single single event type of thing within the scope of a larger game. Those are things where these mental games can get really, really tough to deal with and for a kicker i do understand that there's it's you're hardly ever out there but when you are everybody's watching you it's all on you so you know as a player what was your view towards kickers because i mean you you want to be positive you want to build them up but it was like fucking kickers <laughs> it kind of but it you kind, had good kickers. it kind of is i just we had some really really good kickers and punters in my time at nebraska and i know you can always you know byron bennett because of the, that florida state game i think um isn't held in the regard in which he should be he he had a couple seasons where he was our starting punter and was an amazingly good punter he was a very good kicker um, and I'll always say that that kick in the in the Orange Bowl against Florida State, the line got blown up up front. Florida State got a great jump. He saw that coming and was was. It's either if he kicks it straight to make it, it's getting blocked, or he can try and do the whole like the little bend it like Beckham and try and hook it, and that's what he was trying to do. And the hook didn't carry like he he needed it to. So you know. Um but we had great we had great kickers yeah. and punters. It was hard for us to complain about it. But but it was obvious late. I mean, Matt Rule went for it on fourth down a lot uh, after those. Uh, I mean, it's almost like he's lost faith. Little bit. Now I'm also one of those guys where I don't have a I don't really have much of a problem with the whole going for it on fourth down because in a lot of situations, statistically, if you I mean they always say statistically, you should never punt. If you just go for it on fourth down, 
statistically, you will end up in a better situation than had you punted over the course of an entire season. So it's, it's kind of interesting how stats play into this and how statistically correct things aren't necessarily always followed. So, I mean, there's some coaches out there who, if you've got a pretty good football team, you should be going for it on fourth down every time and not punting. Dylan Raiola was, uh, what, uh, 17 of 27, 257 yards, a touchdown. I I got a lot of to watch a lot of college football yesterday. I watched the um, Alabama-Georgia game, got to watch the Penn State game. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know if everybody on those teams, especially the, the, the kid down at Georgia who's getting all the hype, he telegraphs almost every pass that he has. Georgia but, or Riola? No, Georgia. Okay. And Riola, is, his field vision is amazing. It really, really is amazing. Because I think part of the reason Riola's not at Georgia right now is because he looked around and there was a couple of other good quarterbacks in his class that he was – these are guys he's going to have to be competing against, and I don't think he shies away from competition. But it's interesting to hear you say that because it's one of these deals where he he could have potentially been Georgia's starting quarterback this year. I think when you're looking at how they're playing right now. Yeah, and of course Georgia came back but uh, fell short against Alabama with a 41-34 the final score. Yeah, it was a one touchdown game at the but, end. But I mean he if Rell has been one thing since the season started, which I was a little worried about, I thought we'd have a freshman moment here or there. The dude's just consistent. And he is. He's just very Well, consistent. and it's you know, we've talked about this on the show before that going into this season if there's one thing that I thought about that I really liked about Riola. When you go back and look at his high school career, and he's kind of been panned for this a little bit, the fact that they moved around, that he played at four different high schools, four different coaches, four different groups of players around him, four different schemes. His his productivity was, it was like... It was the exact same everywhere he went. The consistency was almost weird. I mean, he was basically 28 to 32 touchdowns and two to four interceptions every year in high school. And he would, and kind of what you see at Nebraska, he, he can move, he can run, he just doesn't want to. And he's, if he's going to run, he's going to move side to side behind the line of scrimmage to try and free up a, a wide receiver. You just don't see him taking off downfield. But we saw everything we're seeing at Nebraska right now. I'm going back and looking and going, okay, we are in fact seeing that consistency carry over to the next level. And I do think that's pretty impressive because I think that jump from high school football, no matter how good a high school it is, what level of high school you're playing at, that jump to Division I college football, that jump to any level of college football is a really, really big jump. I, I think the, 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 the telltale sign that he sees the field so well, I think he hit, what, eight different receivers? Eight receivers. Yeah, eight receivers. He spreads the ball around. And, I mean, it's easy to see him when he's whole, kind of honing in on, like, Nayor or uh, going to Fedoni. But it, it, he's spreading the ball around and getting the ball to different guys consistently, which if you're a wide receiver – Come to Nebraska right now. You got a quarterback who can sling it, and he's going to find you at some point during the course of the game. He's going to get the ball to everybody. Ja'Cory Barney Jr. was a stud on. on God, I love watching him. And we've been seeing this already. The kid can fly. Uh, and he had, what, the two jet sweeps that went for uh, the one in the first half that went for a big gain. Another one went for a touchdown in the, in the second half. Um, and if you keep following this, uh, that'll be a focus of the Doc's Diagnosis presented by Central Federal Credit Union coming up on Monday. But uh, he's just – you just want to get the ball in his hands in any way. You really do. I mean, he's one of those guys who – it's kind of a cliche, but the kid's a playmaker, which come – I mean – we need to get down to South Florida, get some more of these Miami guys up here in Lincoln. I just, he's a fun kid to watch. Again, he's another, he's a freshman, but it's, you got a kid who's making these plays and has just absolute blazing speed. I was a little bit worried about his size coming out of high school. He's not a big person. He's taken some hits. He's can, he's bounced right back up. 
but he plays tough and the kid can absolutely just I mean he just runs past defenders and the fact that you're seeing him outrun Big Ten defenders, I think, is pretty impressive. Of course, he had uh, four carries for 66 yards, led Nebraska in rushing. He had three catches uh, for 28 yards. Go ahead. The one thing I was going to say that did bug me a little bit about him and this game, you don't want a stud wide receiver being your leading rusher because of jet sweeps. You want to see that coming from a running back. Well, and that was and, my, and that's one thing Nebraska didn't quite get going in this game. Emma Johnson had eight carries for fifty yards, and that's actually was going to be my next question to you. Is it concerning you that no running back is really separating themselves? We haven't seen it yet. And I, early on, I, I mean, I think people thought. Emmett would be the guy that separates out. Then, and then we kind of—I I feel like we kind of started the season with Dowdell instead. Um, and at times, Dowdell's looked like the guy who's going to be that—that that guy who's going to shoulder the load. Uh, and then you see Ramirez in there. It's, it, yeah, you just haven't seen anybody jump out like that. Who there's, they're going to be that every down guy. And I think we need one or two guys that can do that. Now, the other thing is, is that's got to start up front, though, too. I mean, you've got to have more consistent run blocking by the offensive line. And I'm not sure we've seen that, at least not in the two Big Ten games that Nebraska's played. And then, there's a difference between some of these power four defensive lines. I mean, there's a there's a difference between Colorado's defensive line, uh, Northern Iowa's defensive line. I, I mean, these, these those are defensive lines that you're expecting Nebraska to be able to move around. Then you get into the Big Ten and you look at got both Purdue and Illinois have big, strong, mobile offensive linemen. They both have big, strong, mobile defensive linemen. These are units that I think are, are kind of a good they're, – they're, they're a good test for Nebraska because guess what? You're not going to see Colorado defenses anymore for the rest of the year. You're not going to see a Northern Iowa defense going forward here. These are um, – Rutgers has good units on both sides of the ball. Indiana, Ohio State, Iowa, Wisconsin. All of these teams have big, strong, mobile linemen on both sides of the ball. And our offensive line is going to have to figure out a way to step up here. And they've had some injuries. They've had some issues. You got guys banged up. The depth is not necessarily there doesn't matter. They're going to have to get it figured out because Nebraska's running game is not going to get going. It's it's really easy to look at the running backs and say, "Hey, these guys, you'd like to see one of these guys maybe separate out." And I do agree with that. You would like to see that. It doesn't change the fact that Nebraska's def- Nebraska's offensive line rather needs to step up. Okay, let me let me counter that, though, because, and I'll use the doc's diagnosis this week, which uh, you can check out on YouTube, presented by Centris Federal Credit Union. You actually used a play. It was second three in the third quarter. Uh, the, the offensive line blocked it correctly, but instinct told Johnson to go... To take the cut back. To take the cut back. If he would have stayed on the route, if he, he, had, he would have had a first down. If he had stayed play side, which was to the left, instead of cutting back... He would have had a first down, and and you, and he did cut back. There was a bit of a cutback lane. There was actually a really nice hole there. He had two of the two of the receivers double teaming a safety, and one of them didn't come off on Tiedemann and should have come off to block Tiedemann. Left him completely unblocked in the hole, and he just stoned that play dead right at the line of scrimmage. So you had two things happen there. One. The backside blocking needs to be, you got to have guys understanding assignments and getting off on the guy they're supposed to get off on. And the running back does have to, kind of got to trust the guys up front a little bit, at least on that play. We need to see better movement, though, by the offensive line in terms of pushing guys off the ball, getting off of double teams onto those secondary blocks. 
they'll they'll get better. They will. I mean, I, I do think we've got because I think Evans is a good one. I do think Ben Scott's good. I like what I'm seeing from Gatul in terms of a very young offensive tackle who is out there it, kind of manning that. He's probably going to be the left tackle for the rest of the year, I think. Um, so I think he's only going to continue to get better. So there's bright spots on that line. You're going to have to see Latovsky continue to develop and get better. Um, you're going to need to see some of these other younger guys step up and start getting some reps as well. Uh, because guys are going to get hurt. Guys are going to get banged up. You got, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure what the deal was with Micah McCusa, but Boy, there were rumors flying all over the place with him. There is. I, I I mean, there's all. It seems like there's always a little bit of fire where there's some smoke, and I, I I'm worried we're not going to see him play in Lincoln again. Because it was the rumor was he was at the airport going to San Francisco. <laughs> that was what was floating around out there. But here, here's the thing: doesn't matter where he was seen at, where he was going. It's where he's not, and he wasn't with the team in Purdue. And he's been held out the last, the previous two, for segments of the previous two games as well. So something's going on with him, and it sounds like a lot of it is probably off the field based stuff. And that's really unfortunate because I think the guy, uh, from a pure talent standpoint is Nebraska's was Nebraska's most talented offensive lineman. So I think that's a loss. That was a guy when they signed him out of Florida, man, I was fist pumping that move. I I thought that was a, I, I thought that was a great portal sign. Great guy to pick up. He was a guy I wanted to see Nebraska get when he left Baylor and it's just it, – it's kind of it, – it's pretty disappointing to see how that's panned out. But uh, you, you got to let it play out, right? I mean, it, it's just – and that's the problem with social yeah, may, media. Yeah, maybe he'll be back. I just – yeah, forget the San Francisco and who saw him where and where it got reported. The bottom line is that we know there's some issues. He wasn't with the team in Purdue – and he wasn't playing consistently. He wasn't consistently on the field. He'd been specifically held out for portions of the previous well, two games, and that's concerning. Well, and something you can't do as a coach, and because some coaches do do this, some don't. If it, if it becomes a culture issue, you cannot sacrifice culture, right? You, you cannot bend your own rules just because somebody is so elite. And it's it's interesting watching Rule because I think you do have some guys here that like Micah who yeah I don't I think I think Rule's not going to break the culture for that he wants guys to understand hey here's how we do things and if you're not going to be in if you're not going to be aligned with that thinking. Well, you're not playing. A good example would be, and it's a non-Nebraska example, but Greg McDermott, when he went from Northern Iowa to Iowa State, he says he let his culture get away from him because at Iowa State, at, at Iowa State, and he didn't perform at Iowa State. I mean, he would if he wouldn't have taken the Creighton job, he probably would have got fired that next year just because he he just he he bent. He had a lot of guys leave and transfer when the previous coach left that he thought were going to be in place, then you start going, well, heck, I've got to, I've got to go assemble a team. Then you're like, these are the guys I've got. I've got to let them get away with it. You, you know what I'm saying? There's just yeah. a bunch there. You, you don't want more guys leaving. So yes. you kind of yeah. so loosen you, the rules a little bit so guys don't get so upset. So you sacrifice your own personal beliefs. He got a fresh start at Creighton, and I think that's worked out pretty good for him, right? But he, he, He's done okay. He, he will be the first one to tell you that at Iowa State, the culture got away from him. So if, if you're in year number two, You've got to maintain what that it, and culture is hard to define. I mean, it, it's different every place you go. Somebody always asks me, you know, we've got a good culture. What does that mean? Um, well, to me, if it's in a workplace, I just like working there, right? I, I can't. It's not about free booze. It's not about games. It's not about <laughs> stuff like that. It's so, do I like working there or do I not like working there? Because if I like working there, that means I've got a good culture. If all of a sudden you see players get away with something and 
other people are held to a different standard, that creates a bad culture. It's like, well, if they get away with it and I don't, how come I don't? And then, you, then you're not having fun. Exactly. Well, and you, you want to see people treated the same. Um, and, and, I don't, and when I say this, I don't mean like, say like, oh, in the NIL world, we've got to pay everybody the no. same. That's, that's not what I'm saying here. But I mean, if somebody breaks a rule, are they going to be held to the same standard that the superstar is versus the guy who's fifth, fourth, fifth string on the depth chart? I mean, that, that scout team player who may not ever see the game field until a blowout during his when he's a fifth year senior. Cause there's guys like that. It's um, these are though. That's what you want to see is that consistency in terms of how players are treated by the coaching staff. John Bullock had a pick six uh, yesterday, Nebraska Creighton prep kid. Uh, Owen, did you think that was going to happen? Did you think John, the, the bullet kids would be that good of players? I mean, you, you went to prep, uh, they, they played the same time you did, but, uh, John Bullock, uh, a pick six, Nebraska plus one on the turnovers yesterday. They're plus five for the season. They've outscored opponents 31 to nothing off points off turnovers, which, and that's something again, if, if you had looked at Nebraska's record going into the year, or looked at the schedule going into the year rather and said, okay, Five games in, we're four and one, plus five on turnovers. I think most people would be like, all right, this is a good direction of moving. So, the out of kind of, again, I call it my mantra turnovers, penalties, and special teams miscues, the stuff that has really haunted Nebraska. There's one in there that has I, where I feel like Nebraska has kind of flipped that script a little bit, and it's been on the turnovers. So that's that has been a difference maker for Nebraska this year. Whew, just got to get the other ones fixed up. But it was a great play by Bullock. He was in a great position to make that pick and kind of showed some speed there. I mean, you, you kind of realize how good of an overall athlete that that kid is. Uh, Nebraska has held four of its five opponents to 10 points or less. So again, it, it's weird. We have all this positive stuff that we're talking about, but there's still like this uneasy feeling like there is and i think a lot of it goes back to just what we've seen from the the first half of the purdue game special teams mistakes and penalties yeah failure to well and here's another one another stat that jumped out at me nebraska only converted one third down that whole game that's pretty painful i think they were one of eight or on third down conversions, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, give me one second. They were, yeah, they were one of eight. Purdue was seven of 15. Nebraska, one of eight on third down, so, one of one on fourth down. Yeah, so Purdue's just shy of 50%. Nebraska's one of eight. That's a brutal statistic. That's got to get better. But that first half, it was not converting third downs. It was penalties. It was special teams miscues. It was getting into a position to score touchdowns and not getting that conversion to, to, to keep moving the ball in the red zone. That's the Nebraska that's haunted us the last several years. We've seen that. Mike Riley era, all of the Frost era. We saw that last year. Those last four games of the season where you're thinking, God, we just got to win one game and we're going to a bowl. And in four tries, they couldn't get it done. This is stuff that has absolutely haunted us, plagued us, whatever cliche you want to use to describe it. When you see an entire half of football like Nebraska had in the first half yesterday, that's what makes me really uneasy and makes everybody feel a little uneasy about this team. Because again, Purdue's not a good team. When you have a half like that against a team that's not a good team, if that was Illinois, we're down 14 nothing at halftime. I would agree with you. So it's I, I think Illinois is a pretty solid team. They're they're not that bad. And Nebraska sh I hate the whole should have. Nebraska should have beat Illinois. But it was the Zadiska mantra stuff that kept them from winning that game. So I, I just, yeah, there's these little things that Nebraska still, they're going to have to still clean this stuff up because there's better opponents coming. Rutgers is not a bad football team. Indiana's not a bad football team. No, they're all, they're both undefeated. Yeah, like right now, you're, you're looking at the schedule and going, okay, well, um, 
Well, hopefully we can beat UCLA. UCLA like is bad. They're, they're not UCLA good. is Purdue bad. They're not very good. Uh, and I'm still trying to figure out Wisconsin. I'm, I mean, USC beat them yesterday, but I, I'm still not sure how good or is bad Luke Wisconsin is. Is Luke Fickle on the hot seat? So year two. Makes me wonder. It's a good question. I Because um, you know who still pulls the puppet strings up there, right? And then, and then you think Barry still has say over At, that? I don't think he has say, but okay, let's do the Callahan thing and the Peterson thing. Who who did things behind the scenes with donors and former players that created a bit of division? Yeah, yeah. That was Coach Osborne. Yeah. Right? I mean, when you – and I think it's safe to say that Barry Alvarez has the reputation up there, much like Coach Osborne had at Nebraska. Agreed. I, I think a lot of it's going to come down to – do you have somebody available to replace him? I mean, because you've got a coach in Fickle who I do think – I mean, the guy's got a solid track record. He took Cincinnati to the playoffs. True. Um, I thought he was a very good D coordinator at Ohio State. I mean, I think he's a very good coach. I I think that cupboard was re- – dude, I, I think that cupboard was completely bare when he hit the door. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why he got he was brought in to coach is there is because things weren't done the way they needed to be done in this day and age in terms of NIL portal, recruiting, getting guys there who you need to have on campus. I mean, it's just their roster is not what you would expect a Wisconsin roster to be when you look at Wisconsin over the last 20 years. So it's is he on the hot seat? I'm gonna I'm gonna say he's a little at least a little bit. The problem is is do you, when do you pull the trigger on somebody if he consider conti- I mean if they finish 500 or less than 500. Well, if they finish less than 500, he'll be on the hot seat. That's not acceptable. Yeah, but I mean, does he actually get further? No. Between being on the hot seat and getting fired. I I mean I think a lot of it's going to depend on if there's somebody else out there like the next Kalen DeBoer shows up. Like, do you, do you pull the tr- – okay, you know what? Here's a guy that we think would be a better long-term solution for our program than Luke Fickle. We're going to pull the trigger and bring that guy in. So, on the flip side, I think, I, I think Wisconsin is kind of in a situation like Nebraska was where – yeah, your recruiting had fallen off, player development had fallen off, where you had, where you had some holes. Um, I mean, from a from an F, from a development and recruiting standpoint, I still look at the offensive line at Nebraska, and I still think, hey, there's some development and and some recruiting that needs to happen with that offensive line. I mean, when we're sitting here going like, oh my God, thank God Bryce Benhart stuck around for yep. that extra season. Um, and I do think that because we don't have anybody else better to move into that right tackle spot right now. Um, so I, I'm seeing some parallels between the two teams. It's just, I mean, what what would Nebraska's – record be right now if we had played Wisconsin's schedule because Wisconsin's two and two and they had USC they had another tough game in there I forget who it was well they played Alabama that, oh yeah I mean that's kind of yeah. that's kind of a bitch lineup yes. right there so you've got you've got arguably a top top three team in Alabama who you, I mean you can make the argument should Alabama be maybe number one um, oh, Texas is pretty good. Texas is really, really good, and we saw what Texas did to Alabama in Alabama last year. Um, but you've got a you've got an Alabama team that's an outstanding team right now. USC was thirteenth, I believe, going into la- yesterday's game against Wisconsin. If Nebraska plays Alabama and USC, are we two and two? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you're is, playing in Los is, Angeles, is that hot? Is that hot seat uh, per rule? If Nebraska's two and two with losses to USC, you're and not Alabama? comparing apples to oranges. Probably not. But yeah, be, uh, well, be, tell me why. Because I think I think that Wisconsin is a, in a place 
like Luke Fickle is the Bo Pelini. That's where they're at. You th- and, you think you think Fickle came in with the with enough? He had enough street cred. He had enough college cred. But you remember forget, that, that, forget him. What did he have to work with? Because I thought when Pelini hit fans the door, don't care about that. When, fan, fan, okay, what, but when Pelini hit the door in Lincoln. He had, he had NFL talent. He did. He had a bubble. He had a bubble NFL Hall of Famer at D tackle. I'm talking about fan mentality here, and that you went from Barry Alvarez to I'm, Brett Bielema. Well, I'm talking to about Paul, reality. No, though. no. The, the re, reality is perception is reality, and fans have a different expectation right now. Nebraska fans just want to rebuild it and and, and find some consistency. Well, and I Was, had people. Wisconsin's coming off, you know, from Barry to Brett to Paul Christ did a really good job up in. Until that last year, they want they they think they're better than what they are is what I'm trying to get. And fans, okay, that I understand, and that's the point that I'm trying that to make. that I will give you. I'm talking about the true on field where when Pelini came in, he had a roster that could do some damage. Yes. When you when you got Sue running one side of the the line of scrimmage, and you got Joe Gans on the other. You got guys that can play some really good football, and they kept Nebraska humming those for that that first several years that Pelini was in Lincoln, and allowed him to maybe get a little bit better footage for the, his tenure there in Lincoln. Um, I don't know if Chris left much in the cupboard, and I think I, I do think Paul Chris is a very good football coach. Yeah, he'll coach again. Yeah, I think the thing with Paul Chris is the fact that I think he was very, very old school in terms of how he did recruiting, how he looked at player development. I think he was a developmental kind of guy. I think he had one of the best old line coaches in college football. And I also thought he had an outstanding D coordinator. You know, who, that, that's that's what Barry did, though. Exactly, and I and it's a great model. You're going to win a lot of games with that. Guess who else plays that style of football? Iowa. Iowa. Um, I do think Iowa does a better job. I, I think Iowa's recruiting is really underrated, though. I mean, Iowa's not an easy place to get guys to come to. And I don't mean that in the sense that Iowa City. I know what you mean. Iowa City, it's a great town. I love Iowa City. It's a beautiful campus. It is an outstanding academic institution. They got an amazing medical school there. You've got a great hospital system there. I love Iowa City. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about if you're looking at a skill position guy and you're going to say, hey, come here. And you're going to have an insane number of yards passing. You're going to run the show on offense. Wide receivers. You guys are going to get the ball. It's going to be great. I mean, the the three positions on offense where if I'm an offensive football player, I'm only going to Iowa if it's to play O-line. Tight end. Tight end. Uh, linebacker. Running back, running back, just on offense. Oh, oh, well, yeah. yeah. If I want to be a great defensive player, screwed, I'll go anywhere. By the way, did you see Cooper DeGene's brother, the highlight films of him coming out of he's high school? He's a player. He's going, to be a, he's going to be a player. Anyway, if you're a defensive player, go to Iowa. If you want to be a special teams monster, go to Iowa. If you want to be an O-lineman tight end, maybe fullback or running back, go to Iowa. If you want to be a – it's hard to get quarterbacks and wide receivers there. But in Iowa, they do kind of live on that – I don't want to say mediocre mentality. No, they do. But they're like, hey, we've got a system. We're going to get 8 to 10 wins a year, and every couple of years we're going to pop out an 11-win season. If you're a recruit, is is – is that what you want? No, it's not. It's not. Not 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 your they, upper echelon recruit. But they still get enough really good football players to go there that they continue to do damage in the Big Ten. So they recruit very well. So the difference I'd make between Iowa in terms of and Wisconsin de- and Wisconsin when you make that comparison of de- defense, special teams, player development, run game, Iowa continues to kill it because. They are very, very good at recruiting. I know family members and friends whose whose kids have been recruited by Iowa, and they say, dude, 
getting a recruiting trip to Iowa is it's an experience. It's the real deal. Paul Chris was not doing that at Wisconsin, okay. and I think that killed him at Wisconsin. And I think the fallout of that is what's killing Luke Fickle. They don't have – the cupboard's still half empty up there. And that's where I say I, I, I think it's an apples and oranges comparison when you talk about Pelini coming to Lincoln versus Luke Fickle going to Madison. It's apples and oranges because – Pelini had a ton of really good players to play with. But two things can be right. You're right, but I'm also right from the fan mentality where you've gone through Pelini, correct, Riley, Frost. You're just ready for for some consistency. Well, and you're, somebody made this comment to me on Twitter yesterday. Hey, look at Indiana. First year coach, so far looks like they're hitting home runs. That's frustrating from a fan perspective because you're sitting there going like, dude, freaking Indiana? Yeah. They're 5-0? and oh? How the hell did that – like, I don't even know who their coach is. Like, oh, I, like Tom Allen's decoordinating somewhere right now. I don't know where he's at, but um, – it's. I mean, this is one of these things you're looking at going like, and I don't even know what players they have. Like, I have no idea what kind of talent they have. But even like Frost and Mickey Joseph were able to eventually outcoach Indiana, for God's sake. And now they got a guy in there who's – that. that's frustrating from a fan. I do get that. You look at that and you're like, well, why can't we hire somebody – who turns us around yeah. and we punch out a 5-0 start to the season. Um, you'll notice Dr. Rob's wearing a Nebraska polo. Of course, if you're looking for a new polo shirt, looking for a new t-shirt, looking for a new sweatshirt, uh, any Husker gear, go to Husker Hounds, two locations in the Omaha area, including the Superstore at 84th and Center. Scott Strunk will take care of you and uh, make sure to walk in and say, hey, I heard him talking about you on the Doc Talk podcast. Again, Husker Hounds, two locations, or you can go online to huskerhounds.com. You know where I got my shirt? Uh, Husker Hounds. From Scott. Yeah. Husker Hounds. Husker Hounds. Uh, if you need legal representation, I was talking to our good uh, f- friend and lawyer, Connor Orr, over the week. Um, he does litigations. He does um, estate planning. Uh, the The firm is growing, so make sure to go to orlawgrp.com. That's orlawgrp.com. You can't miss Connor. He's about a 6'1", 6'2", ginger. Right, I mean, with, with, that is a he is that is about as Irish as you. Yeah, get. I when mean, you look at him like I. You, you look at you look at Connor Orr and you go, put a Guinness in his hand. You, you, Jameson's in the other, and he's that's there, there's like a little taste of Ireland. I'm going to give you a Guinness, and you're going to go spot the Irishman here, and you go that guy right yeah. there. But he's also really good in the courtroom, and he's here to help you for all your legal needs. Again, OrLawGRP.com. Got a text over. Uh, we'll get to Rutgers here in a sec, but you know where I'd like to take you? My buddy Dan Schlecker, who is, uh, he, he just retired. I hang out with him. He went to Italy with Anjanette and I. Texted me this, but he was at Oktoberfest in Munich. Oh. And I'm like, he goes, there's like 100,000 people a day there. I, you and I, it's right in the middle of the season, so we could podcast. <laughs> oh, and you want to go to Munich with us? We're gonna. He says yes. So maybe, maybe we go to Munich and just uh, we'll, we'll podcast from Munich at Oktoberfest. My younger brother played football in the old World League yeah. NFL Europe. He was in Berlin. the The thing that was interesting to him, he he said, every town in in Germany has these giant open air beer gardens. And he goes, you, you always hear about Oktoberfest. He said Germans basically Oktoberfest year round. So he said you go there, you get kebabs, you get some schnitzel, you you sit there and just drink beer outside on basically every town has the world's largest patio and you just hang out and drink beer. Drink German beer and it's great. So up we ne- should we should do it. Up next for Nebraska is going to be Rutgers. Uh, Rutgers uh, is off to its best start since it joined the Big Ten. Um, so you got to go back uh, several years. They are unbeaten. Um, you got to remember last time Greg Schiano was at Rutgers, they were what Big East yeah. when the Big East still yeah. existed. Yeah. So um, th- the thing about them, th- they're beatable. First of all, it's a beatable team. But this team 
knows its identity. I mean, it, it does what it, it, this is so simplistic and simple minded, but it does what it does. And they don't make a lot of mistakes. I mean, again, you know, I think Greg Schiano is a very, very good football coach. Um, I thought it was a mistake to leave Rutgers in the first place. He was that was, that was like Paul Fitzgerald at Northwestern. It fit. It was a good fit. And when he let that, he had them humming on all cylinders when he left. But Didn't do super well as a head coach outside of Rutgers, but I thought he was a very good coach. He had a couple of runs as a D coordinator there before coming back to take over at Rutgers again. Um, and I thought he did an outstanding job doing that. I always thought Shiano was an outstanding an outstanding coach. Now, they're going to run the football. Uh, Kyle uh, Monengai, uh, he had 132 yards uh, against Washington, one TD. Uh, Samuel Brown, number 27, who you'll see in the doc's diagnosis. He had another. He had um, a, and he's got some speed, and he's got some size to him. He does. He just ran on that touchdown run, which we do on the diagnosis. He runs through two or three blockers. I'm sorry, two or three defenders, rather. So it's – the guys – they can carry the ball. Their offensive line, I think, it, it's not the biggest offensive line that you're going to see out there. Actually, you, you show them getting pushed around. But they got they do uh, – Washington's defensive line got some really good – they almost over-penetrated, and it cost them on a number of plays where you can come too far upfield where the ball carrier is past you by the time you realize what's going on. And that happened on a couple of these runs that, that Rutgers had. Um, so it's able to get push against them. You're going to see Ty Robinson, you're going to see Huttmacher get upfield push on that offensive line. They're going to get into the backfield. The kicker is, are they going to run themselves out of the play? And you come too far upfield as a defensive lineman, you actually create a hole. You create a gap there and run yourself out of the play. They're going to have to be careful not to do that in this game. Um, the thing that I was impressed about watching Rutgers, it's a tough offensive line. They're very assignment savvy. I mean, guys are getting fit. They're going to where they need to go. And then they stick with their blocks. Even if they get pushed out of position, they're staying in contact with the defender. So even if, they're, even if they as offensive linemen are getting pushed around a bit by some of these bigger, stronger D linemen, they're still maintaining that fit and keeping that guy from making a tackle. And that's that's key for a team like like Rutgers, who is going to be a little bit undersized up front, but has still essentially controlled lines of scrimmage in the games they've played. You know, despite the running game, they got a hell of a quarterback in Ethan Callum McManus, who he's just consistent. He was uh, 14 of 24, 115 yards and a touchdown. Say that name again. Callum McManus. There is an Irish name for you. Is it? I, I, I would have thought so. it was Greek. Or that's the full name? Yeah. Ethan, gonna... Ethan Callick McManus. Oh, well, that's totally Greek then. Yeah. I thought it was Callick McManus. McManus is kind of pretty Irish. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, he, he's a good quarterback. This is his second year starting, I think. Um, so you get that consistency at quarterback. You get consistency at running back. Um, does Nebraska's – tendency to get now i know they held purdue to 50 yards rushing purdue's a bad well, football team 74 they had 22 yeah. loss and yeah, the sack they had five sacks yeah the sack the, yard college has to go what the nfl does it really needs to just go what the nfl does and not count that against the rushing yards but uh d does nebraska's inability at times to stop the run worry you at all it does if you see it what i'm hoping to see is i mean you yeah, you kind of saw some question marks there with the, the Northern Iowa game, where Northern Iowa controlled a lot of clock in that game, and that was a little disconcerting. At the same time, then you come back, you got Illinois. And I thought Illinois did a very good job controlling the line of scrimmage, moving the ball on the ground when they had to. Um, and my hope was is, is that that would be a bit of a wake-up call for Nebraska. Here's the question. Did Nebraska answer that call against Purdue? 
Or is Purdue just that bad of a football team? That bad of a football team? Because Purdue does have a – their running backs – actually, I thought Purdue's running backs were very good football players. They've got some good they've got some good talent at that position. I know their line has done well. They just God, they just don't put it together. And I actually thought Purdue relied way too heavily on their passing game. And I thought that kind of haunted them as well too. It gave Nebraska's D it, it played in it played into the strength of Nebraska's defense. So that's that's something that I'm coming out of this Purdue game and I'm trying to figure out like, okay, well, did we clean some stuff up against that, that we got hurt on by in that Illinois game? Did we did we clean that up or not? Or is Purdue just that bad? And it's going to be hard to tell until we get another game or two under our belt against a team that wants to run the ball, which and that's the thing. I don't think Purdue was really all that gung-ho about trying to establish the run. Now, that actually surprised me a little bit because I thought after the Northern Iowa game, after the Illinois game, I thought Purdue was going to come out and try to establish the run. And we even went over that with the diagnosis the week before. We looked at some of the stuff Purdue does in their run game with some of their backfield motion, moving guys around, creating a little misdirection to try and throw the defense off and hit a consistent run game. And we just did not. They didn't even really try. They didn't run the ball well. Nebraska stopped them when they did run, but they didn't try to run a whole lot. That, like I said, that left me a little bit surprised. So, it, because of those things, it leaves me here with this question mark. We're going to have to see what what happens this next week if Nebraska really truly did clean anything up after that Illinois game. Uh. Balloons are returning to uh, Memorial Stadium for the Rutgers game, so they're going to be like special games they do the balloons for. That'll make the tree huggers all pissed off, but I like the balloons, so I'm glad balloons are coming back. Uh, Coming up before the Regents, and I do want to get this in before we wrap things up, the Regents are going to vote on alcohol sales at volleyball games and, and football games for next year. And apparently the the vote numbers are there that it's going to get approved. It, it's, it sounds like this is a formal stamping it, at this point. I don't think you would bring it to the regents unless you knew you had the votes. I agree. You know, and I it's, agree. And by the way, it's a good call. It's a very good call. It's about time. It's not just about revenue. It's about fan experience. Now, I don't think they should let fans out at halftime. I think once you're in the stadium, you're in the stadium. I agree. Because I actually think that cuts down on drinking. Because you're going to go, you're going to order a Bush Light and you're going to go, what the hell? It's 11 bucks. Yeah, Bush Light's $11. Good for you. Yeah, but when you're at a sporting event, I mean, I, I don't know how much people really, I mean, you can you can complain about it. I mean, the the experience I had at a Nebraska sporting event was, and again, I've talked about this numerous times on the podcast. When you went to Big Ten wrestling, and when they when Lincoln hosted it a couple of years ago, that was the test run for alcohol sales at an athletic event in Lincoln. Now, again, they held it at Pinnacle Bank. It's a city facility. It's not a university facility. But they did the trial run with alcohol sales there, and they've since served alcohol at basketball games. Listen, but it works it, at the College World Series. Yeah. It works at NCAA tournament events. It, uh, well, it, it, it works at individual college yes. football stadiums. Almost, yes. I shouldn't say almost everybody. I mean, heck, we even we t- we asked Troy Dannon about this at Tulane, where they have beer sales in the stadium at Tulane. You can, oh yeah, you can go to any of these other schools, and and the thing that's always two things. One, fans are going to buy the alcohol. They'll buy the beer, whether it's eight bucks, 11 bucks, whatever for a bush light or a white claw, whatever it is. They're going to, they'll pay that for it and be happy to have it available. But it's also going to cut down on overall drinking. And that's one thing that's borne out Every study that anybody's ever done, when you go back and look at alcohol-related events at sporting events, those numbers drop once you start serving alcohol inside the venue. Now, keep in mind, there's always going to be some dumbass, right? There's going to be a dumbass, and you're like, that's why we shouldn't serve alcohol. But there's dumbasses now yes. when they're not serving alcohol, and there's more of them because everybody's going, okay, well, once the game starts, we're done drinking till halftime. 
I'm gonna I'm gonna hammer three here real quick and shotgun that last one walking into the stadium. And by the time you get to your seat, you're blitzed. And that's that's what serving alcohol in the stadium tends to reduce the amount of. And I think that's a good thing. All right. That's another fun podcast. If you All have our it, podcasts. That's true. That's, you know, we're going to be alone next week. Owen's going to San Diego. Doing anything fun? He's going to be on the beach. Nice. Yeah. Although I will say the Pacific... Beaches are nice. That water's not very warm down there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's just me and you next weekend, which is fine. If you missed any uh, part of the uh, any other, our other podcast, you can go to YouTube, subscribe to our channel. If you're listening on Podbean, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcast, go ahead and subscribe to the podcast there. It's been interesting. A lot more people watching on the YouTube. Our audio listens have decreased but our video listens are going way up which is which is cool to see um but uh, you can get us anywhere really you find your podcast people so. love the youtube they do like youtube so uh subscribe to the channel whether it's on video or anywhere else and uh send us a note at doctalksports at gmail.com doctalksports at gmail.com for owen justice for dr rob zadis i'm travis justice we will talk to you next week on the doc talk podcast <laughs>